The lives of the first two kings of Judah, Saul and David, are told in lengthy stories comprising large portions of their life. Indeed, David's story is told in over 60 chapters, which is the largest amount of narrative material in the Bible apart from that pertaining to Jesus. In contrast, the story of Judah's third king, King Solomon, is comparatively brief, told in the books of 1 Kings chapter 1 through 11 and 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. And while there is plenty of interesting narrative in these chapters, the story of King Solomon is perhaps best summarized in a few major themes that stretch throughout his life. These principal themes are that of wisdom, of wealth, and of women. And an understanding of Solomon is perhaps best gained by looking at these themes and how they play out in his story, as well as in the other books of the Bible connected to King Solomon. The first major theme of Solomon's life is that of wisdom. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon is newly anointed as king of Judah. In a vision he is given during a dream while at Gibeon, God asks him what he would have God give to him. And rather than asking for wealth or honor or long life, he asks God instead for understanding that he may well govern his people. Solomon asks God, Give thy servant therefore an understanding mind to govern thy people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this thy great people? God is pleased by this answer and gives Solomon an abundance of wisdom, making him the wisest person who ever lived. Solomon's profound wisdom is immediately shown in the following passage where he is asked to adjudicate between two women, one of whom son has died. Both women lived together, and both gave birth at approximately the same time. However, one night, one of the women accidentally sleeps on and kills her own child, and the other alleges she swaps the children, replacing the dead child with the other's live son. Both then claim the live child, and both allege it is the other woman who killed their own child. Solomon, to determine the truth of the situation, asks that a sword be brought to him, and then orders that the living child be divided in half between the two women. One, the natural mother, protests, saying, No, please give the live child to the other woman, just do not let it perish. Whereas the second woman says, Fine, let the child be divided. Solomon, sensing where the true motherly love actually lied, gives the child to the first woman. And Solomon's wisdom in adjudicating between the two women goes far and wide, and his renown for wisdom grows among the people. Indeed, Solomon thereafter becomes known as a great font and curator of wisdom. He writes 3,000 proverbs. He writes 1,005 psalms. He is known as carefully collecting and organizing Proverbs and has a reputation as the beginner of the Bible's wisdom literature. And King Solomon's wisdom is on full display in 1 Kings chapter 10 when the Queen of Sheba comes to behold all of King Solomon's wealth and prosperity and also asks of him many difficult questions, all of which he answers with his wisdom. Solomon is perhaps best known as a wise king. However, Solomon also had a reputation for being wealthy. His father, David, had been remarkably successful in his military exploits and had significantly expanded the borders of the United Kingdom of Israel and Judah. Solomon inherited this kingdom and enjoyed peace through his years, amassing great amounts of wealth in his kingdom. His kingdom is described as, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. His reign is characterized by peace on his borders, by prosperity within, and by a happy people and tribute is brought to him by the neighboring nations, 
greatly amassing the wealth of his kingdom and his own personal wealth. Moreover, within this time of peace, Solomon takes up great building projects within the city of Jerusalem. He builds his own house and a house for his wife, a daughter of the king of Egypt. He builds the house of the forest of Lebanon, the hall of pillars, the hall of the throne, or the hall of judgment. He completes the wall around the city of Jerusalem begun by his father David. And most importantly, he builds the temple. The description of the building of the temple to God takes place in 1 Kings 5-7, through and like the building of the ark and its accessories, the construction of the temple is described in great detail. Its plans, its dimensions, its building processes, and all the extensive ornamentation of nets, of chains, of pomegranates, of pillars, of capitals, and all these various decorations of gourds, of oxen, of stands, lions, wreaths, wheels, even a sea of bronze, these all help to illustrate the opulence of this temple that has been built. It's noteworthy that Solomon's father, David, had intended to build a temple, but was only discouraged after a vision from Nathan, his seer, discouraged him from moving forward. Instead, in the last chapters of First Chronicles, David makes extensive preparations for the building of the temple, amassing stone and lumber and various metals needed, as well as forming plans and organizing the building crews. However, David was not to build the temple, as is written in First Chronicles chapter 22. God says to David, You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. It is interesting that while King David was a king of righteousness after God's own heart, a model king, yet nonetheless, because of the warfare with which he was engaged, the temple was not to be built by him, but rather by his son Solomon, who was a king of peace. And so Solomon over a period of seven years, builds and completes this temple to God, thereafter bringing up the ark into the temple, and dedicates it with an extensive prayer that the people might remember God's works and that they might turn to God in their times of need and distress. And in the culmination of Solomon's reign, in his summary, it is written in 1 Kings chapter 10, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put into his mind. Every one of them brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, myrrh, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. Solomon was, in short, a wealthy king. And in addition to his wisdom and his wealth, Solomon is also known for his association with women. The last chapter in his life story, 1 Kings chapter 11, details his many wives and how they led his heart astray. It is written there, Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not wholly follow the Lord, as David, his father, had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemoth, the abomination of Moab, and for Moloch, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. At various points in the Mosaic Law, the people of Israel are cautioned against taking foreign wives. Now, there's nothing wrong with foreign wives in themselves, but the warning was always accompanied by the caution that the wives could take away the hearts of the people to worship the gods of the land. That is, taking foreign wives or husbands could draw the people's hearts away to worship their local deities. This, unfortunately, is what happens to Solomon. 
And though his reign is marked by peace, by prosperity, by great wisdom, nonetheless, near the end of his life, his heart is drawn astray to worship other gods. The consequences for this are dire. While Saul and David both made major mistakes, the consequences for Solomon's error here is severe. The judgment is given later in this chapter, 1 Kings 11. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your mind, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, for the sake of David my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Now this same warning had come up again and again and again. It is included multiple times in the Law of Moses. It is present in the last speeches of Moses and of Joshua. And it is given through prophets and visions to Saul, to David, and to Solomon. A warning that they carefully follow the statutes, commandments, and ordinances of God. And should they do so, they and their descendants will be blessed. However, if they do not follow the commandments of God, God will withdraw his blessings from them. This, of course, changes with Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus fulfills the commands of the law perfectly in himself, thereby bringing the law to conclusion. However, these stories of the kings of Judah, as the law is lived out actually in the land, gives us the example of how the law ought to have been lived out and where the kings, even the best of them, fell short of perfectly abiding by God's holy law. Hereafter, while there was hope in these first kings of Judah, things take a sharply downward turn. And in each of the many kings of Judah to follow, we see a general incomplete abiding by the law of God. The story of Solomon's life, however, is incomplete without mention of the other books that are attributed to King Solomon. The most famous is probably the Book of Proverbs, a collection of hundreds of short sayings of wisdom that have been attributed to Solomon. This book begins with the words, The Proverbs of Solomon, Son of David, King of Israel. And while the last couple chapters of the book contain proverbs composed by other individuals, most of the Proverbs are considered as attributable to King Solomon. They contain practical everyday wisdom, such as, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And also there are Proverbs about life with God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. And in their hearts human beings plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. This book of Proverbs is a collection of the wisdom of Solomon, which continues to be a source of guidance and of wisdom for Christians today. A second book attributed to Solomon is Ecclesiastes. The book begins, The words of the teacher, or the preacher, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem. This book of Ecclesiastes also contains many beloved proverbs, including, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. But if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, and is not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie down together, they are warm. But how can one be warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And again I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all. 
and two, it contains the famous words, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. However, this book of Ecclesiastes is also noted for its cynicism. The author of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, pursues wealth, pursues success, pursues great building projects, and even pursues acquisition of wisdom itself. Yet in every pursuit, he finds they are empty, meaningless, full of vanity. And this conclusion, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, pervades this book. And the conclusion of Solomon on his own life, after his enormous wealth and success and wisdom, is that it is best to live a simple life, to live humbly, to appreciate what one has, and to live a life of fear in the Lord. The third book attributed to Solomon is the Song of Songs, or the Song of Solomon. This begins with the words, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And this book is unique in the scriptures in that it is an extended love song, a romantic poem to Solomon's beloved. It is somewhat complex, composing a shifting perspective through the poem, and Solomon himself appears a couple times as a character in this love song. And this song of songs includes some beautiful imagery, including some rather explicit romantic language. For instance, he writes, You have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with a glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. How sweet is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine, and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. And so forth, again, unique in the scriptures in its emphasis on romantic love. And lastly, the book of Psalms contains two psalms that are attributed to Solomon, both, interestingly, based on the themes that characterize Solomon's life. Psalm 72 speaks of judging the people with righteousness, judging the poor with justice, and defending the cause of the poor. It speaks of righteousness, peace, and prosperity flourishing, it mentions the extensive dominion from sea to sea and of gifts, even the gold of Sheba being given to him. This is a remarkable prayer for and thanksgiving for the many blessings of King Solomon's reign. And Psalm 127 expresses the vanity found through the book of Ecclesiastes. Unless the Lord builds the house in vain does the workman labor. Unless the Lord keeps watch over the city, in vain does the watchman keep vigil. In vain your earlier rising, your going later to rest, when he pours gifts upon his beloved while they slumber. And the second half of the psalm is a reflection on the blessing of sons, of which Solomon, having 700 wives and 300 concubines, probably had many. These three additional books of the Bible attributed to Solomon along with a couple psalms from the book of Psalms, helps to flesh out our understanding of this King Solomon. And while we have comparatively brief narrative on Solomon's life, we have, through these books, much greater insight into his own mind and person. In the next two videos, we go rather quickly through the next of the kings of Judah, as the information is comparatively much briefer and the stories much shorter. And in doing so, we'll also cover the history of the kingdom, its gradual decline, and its ultimate conquest by the kingdoms of Assyria and of Babylon. So thanks for joining in this life of King Solomon, and may God bless you today.